Good afternoon, everyone. It's noon on a Wednesday, which means it's time for another Lunch and Learn with the, uh, our folks here at K- Kuka Rankin. And some of you are here because you're looking to catch into the uh, MapTech event. We had to reschedule that one due to uh, some accessibility problems. Uh, needless to say, we have uh, Brady Reich from our Las Vegas office at Kuka Rankin to take us through LIDAR 101. So an understanding of LIDAR and where LIDAR is best applied and best used. Uh, So throughout this program, as usual, if you have questions, please drop them into the chat box. For those of you that are watching on Facebook, go ahead and and, uh, chat to us over the Facebook line, and we'll provide those questions over to our presenter as we go. Without anything further, Brady, we're just going to hand it right straight over to you. You have the floor. Perfect. Thank you very much, Douglas. And thank you, everybody, for coming in to another Lunch and Learn. Um, Again, as Douglas mentioned, we put this on every Wednesday at 12 o'clock. So uh, to get started, let me go ahead and start sharing this information here for you. Get this showing up. All right. So uh, as Douglas mentioned today, we're talking LiDAR 101. This is very uh, high level information. We're not going to go uh, too deep into the, the inner, working, inner workings of the systems, just a, a very high level uh, overview today. So why am I here today talking to you about this? Well. Uh, I am the Virtual Design and Construction Reality Capture Specialist for Kukarinkin, probably the single largest title possible through the company right now. Um, I'm CFR 14 Part 107 certified as a drone operator uh, for commercial purposes. I have a lot of enterprise technical support as my background. Uh, I'm still a uh, instructor with Sundance Media Group as well, and I am one of uh, four individuals throughout the United States uh, who is an authorized PIX40 instructor using the ambassadorship program. So I've got a lot of technical knowledge on uh, LiDAR, photogrammetry, different things from aerial and terrestrial perspectives. So that's why I'm here talking to you today. So uh, very first thing, what is LiDAR? LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. Um, and really to, to cover this very quickly, uh, what we're saying is that a laser gets sent out from the sensor down to um, a point on, say, the, the back wall, for an example, and comes back to the sensor. We're using lasers to detect uh, the range from the sensor to that wall, and we're also checking the time that it took from uh, the sensor to the wall. So we're taking into calculations a lot of um, a lot of that information, and it happens very, very rapidly. A lot of these systems we're talking about capture upwards of 2 million points per second. So very, very fast. So LiDAR is just shooting lasers out to gather distances, right, over time. So diving into how does the LiDAR actually work? So there are several different types of LiDAR from uh, oscillation to uh, polygonal to uh, many different types of reflectors. So I have a couple different examples here that are shown up as A, B, C, and D. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking a laser from uh, from a laser pointer, right, if you will, to a mirror, and that mirror is what's turning and rotating around to capture our points. So what we have to remember is as we're using LiDAR, it will only capture what it can see. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of that just in, in a few minutes. But what I would like to bring up is we have a little graphic here on the right-hand side that shows uh, just a little illustration. There's a laser that's being sent out to the mirror. The mirror is then turning and gathering the data around this uh, this object or inside of this room. What I'd like to point your attention to from here is we have a little green circle down on the bottom right, kind of in the middle of that uh, that moving uh, image for you. And you'll see as the laser scans and it hits that center object, now we're creating points around the object that we can see. So it is obscuring that back corner of the room. So we have to be very uh, uh, meticulous and precise on exactly where we place these scanners within the system uh, or within your site to gather your data. So different types of scanners will scan in different types of patterns, uh, which we won't necessarily get too deep into today. Uh, now, let's just talk about some different types of scanners that we have and, and just give you a little bit of information about them. So we have different systems such as a P-series scanner, um, like say a P-40 scanner, which is extremely high resolution that has uh, tremendous amounts of distance. However, it takes five to upwards of almost 10 minutes for a scan in a small section without doing a full 360 degrees. So these systems are very, very precise, but they take a very long time. 
The next one down that we'll just uh, briefly talk about is the BLK360 G2. This uh, is a scanner that is uh, uh, on the more affordable range of things. Uh, and this does uh, about 420,000 uh, points per second. However, we don't get nearly the distance that we do with the P-series scanner. So what we're really going to run into is what do you need for your job? Right. What do you need for your deliverable? If you don't know uh, how often you're going to scan or uh, where you're going to be scanning it, then make sure you're talking to some of the experts where we can help walk you through the process to find out what works best for you. Uh, the BLK 362 is great for uh, architects. It's very fast and you get tremendous amounts of data, but the, the range is limited. Then we move into something like an RTC 360, which I, I actually have one sitting up right behind me. As you can see, this system. Um, is scientifically proven. A lot of public safety uh, facilities use this system because it's scientific, it's accurate, and it's repeatable over and over and over. Uh, and it's been proven in court. So this system, uh, much higher resolution than the BLK uh, 360 G2, but it does take a little bit longer to uh, to scan in most cases. And as we're we're talking about these, what you'll what you'll see with the uh, uh, the moving picture on the right hand side of the screen is the centerpiece is still rotating around, so I'll flip it around behind me, and there's a laser that's getting shot basically to that mirror and flipping it around. So in essence, with our scanners that we've talked about so far, the P-Series, the BLK, and the RTC360, we are shooting in two directions at the same time because the mirror is turning 360 degrees on the Y-axis. Now we're scanning in both directions for the RTC. So in order to scan the entire room, the whole system rotates as it scans in two directions at the same time, just to gather more and more data. Now, there are pros and cons to different types of static LiDAR uh, uh, scanners. Uh, the RTC360 is my personal favorite because we have uh, basically what's called the VIS technology to register each scan that's done within the room or within the facility together as one point cloud. So it's an easy way to merge uh, each scan together. And then uh, we can get down to the MS60, which is um, not quite the same range as a P-series scanner, but pretty close. Um, it's slow, but what happens is the system, instead of scanning in both directions, like the RTC or the VOK or the P-series scanner, scans in one direction, and essentially it moves the center mirror up and down constantly. So it's not spinning a full 360 degrees, it's up and down and up and down as the, the whole housing slowly rotates to capture its data. So uh, we can combine that with many different types of equipment. Again, depending on your scenario, would depend on which type of LiDAR scanner you would need uh, in, that, in that space. Now, you may have heard about SLAM LiDAR uh, systems, which is a simultaneous uh, localization and mapping systems. These types of sensors are actively scanning 360 degrees uh, in your horizontal and in your vertical. Uh, they usually get rid of part of the back because you either hold them or put them on uh, a different robot to basically walk this system around. But what's happening is that it's also using the imaging um, on the or the cameras on the system to uh, follow the images to then create your point cloud. Remember, I just talked about the RTC. We set up one scan, move to the next, rescan it. Now we have to merge the point clouds together. The advantage here for SLAM LiDAR is there's no registration. What happens is that it's constantly scanning, look at the, looking at the geometry, figuring out what the telemetry uh, data or the trajectory of the, uh, the system from uh, every time that it does a rotation. So you physically hold on to it and you walk at the same time. So we gain tremendous efficiency with this. However, we are getting less accuracy and less data out of these types of sensors. So this would be like the BLK G2, uh, I'm sorry, the BLK2 Go, uh, also, the, BO, uh, the BOK ARC system. So the BOK GO has an internal battery, so it can hold it and walk with the system. The, uh, the BOK ARC system is tethered to an animal or some sort of a, a robot of some kind that powers the system. So then we go into solid state LiDAR. What is solid state? Well, this just means, remember how we were saying there's mirrors and the lasers that are kind of bouncing around in order to get your information? Solid state means there's an array of uh, LEDs that are basically sending out pulses in a specific pattern 
there's no moving parts. It's all solid state, which means that uh, we are able to gather information quickly and repeatedly getting the same information from the same uh, area. However, uh, th there's no moving parts, which means that there's less breakdown of pieces or mirrors that or motors that might have issues. So solid state is really starting to come around now and it's now becoming something that's viable for uh, aerial or terrestrial type of scanning. So solid state just means that there's no moving parts within that system. So uh, most of you might have an iPhone. iPhone 12, 13, or 14 has a solid state LiDAR system built into it. Now we have limited range for the LiDAR systems. Uh, we're sitting at about 10 to 12 feet uh, for that LiDAR system. Uh, but as long as we can get close to our subject, we can capture LiDAR data from what's already in your pocket. Then we move into different aerial LiDAR systems, and these are going to be uh, a kind of a hybrid in between a uh, mirror or a mirrorless system and a solid state system, depending on which type of LiDAR we're talking about. So uh, a few popular models right now is we've got the DJI L1, uh, which is a very entry level, affordable way to get into LiDAR scanning. Uh, however, depending on how it's processed, you might have uh, strip alignment issues. You might have different pieces that uh, don't don't align properly in your horizontal or your vertical axis. Uh, so there are different softwares on the back end that help reduce any errors that you get. Uh, but we're still talking about something that uh, with the L1 system, for example, using, uh, uh, say, canopy penetration through trees, that it it does struggle because it's entry level um, and the way that it scans is a little bit different. It's more like the uh, MS-60 that I said earlier. If we look here, what happens with the mirror is it kind of turns up and down as you're moving forward. This is what it's doing. It's scanning forward and back with that uh, with a gimbal as the internal uh, scanner is scanning your pattern. Then we move on to something like the GOQ 515, which is internally called the Vegemite because it does such an amazing job with uh, penetration through the canopies. This type of system is more like the RPC where it just spins. However, the difference is our drone doesn't turn at the same time that we're scanning our LiDAR. It's always scanning in a circular pattern. So we have this, uh, uh, I, I would say it's uh, like a fan on by either side um, and down below that is scanning. Different types of sensors will have different ranges and uh, different accuracies out of it but they're all kind of scanning side to side. So as we are passing something, it's important to remember with LiDAR, you want to go parallel with something. So you're flying next to the building rather than go perpendicular to the building because our scan is always going to be side to side independent of which way our drone is moving. So we want to go side to side, basically parallel with them in order to scan the side information of, of that building. And um, that's true for the, the 515 and with the uh, 720 GeoQ. So some systems have a single uh, pattern that, that is found out. Some systems like the GOQ720 uh, have three different patterns where it's slightly forward in the middle and slightly back. So as we pass over the building, we can now go perpendicular to that building and we're scanning the front side of it. We pass over the top, we get the top side of it. And then after we pass over the top, then we're scanning the back side of it because there's different fans uh, depending on the type of sensor that it is. So there's many different ways to get into that. So some of the benefits of using a LiDAR system is there's no need for light outside of the SLAM LiDAR and colorization. So as the example that I have up here, which is called the uh, the Wheel of Misfortune in uh, Las Vegas over by the Three Kids Mine, I'll show you some data sets actually from this uh, as well. But in this example, we have it colorized, which means that we have to have some sort of light so we can determine what the color is by taking pictures and then tying that to the point cloud. If we were to fly this in the middle of the night, we can still gather data, but it won't be colorized. Um, it's still measurable, it's still accurate, but it's just not color. Um, slam LiDAR, on the other hand, if we had the, the handheld one that we would walk through a building with, if we have no light, it's not gonna work because we can't visually see where we're at to look at the geometry to figure out what our um, our trajectory is from that, that unit. So outside of slam LiDAR, you don't need light. So that's a, a huge benefit. Um, it's excellent for canopy penetration. Depending on how densified the trees are would depend on how much penetration we're able to get to the ground. Most people who are looking at LiDAR from surveyors to uh, uh, architects to 
um, archaeologists, they want to get what's what's there under the ground. They can care less about the canopy in most situations. We still capture canopy for those in the forest industry uh, who want to do tree volumetrics or, or tree count and uh, tree species uh, verification through your data. However, uh, most people looking at LIDAR want to get down to the ground. So it does an excellent job through penetration through the canopy. Uh, it's very rapid. So every time we send the, the laser out, it touches the ground, comes back, and it has to have two or more returns, depending on the type of sensor. And we are able to basically log that down. Uh, I always say it's like an Excel spreadsheet. You have XYZ value, and here's your point. XYZ value, here's your point. So we're loading this Excel value into the processing program, which means it's very, very fast over something like photogrammetry, where you're looking at almost 10x times more time to process the data from 2D images to a 3D image. It's repeatable. So over time, you go through and scan the same thing, you will get the same results as long as you have the same conditions environmentally with your altitude, your speed, um, uh, the cloud cover, um, depending on if there's moisture in the air, there's a lot of different factors that, that we will help train you to understand. And it's very efficient for large areas. Uh, if we have large uh, spaces where we need to go through and fly, it's not conducive to fly photogrammetry because we're limited to maybe uh, 10 acres on photogrammetry for a battery versus if we have a lighter, we can get almost 100 acres on a battery in about 30 minutes. So it's very, very efficient for those large areas. Now, some of the challenges uh, on the other side of that is we're limited to what we can see. As we looked at the uh, moving image, the GIF earlier, what happens is if there's an obstruction in the way, we can't scan what's behind the obstruction. We then have to move the sensor to the other side to then gather that information. Uh, moving objects do create noise. So as we look at a few data sets here in just a moment, you'll see some cars driving through and it, it creates some, some noise and we would have to go through our system and clean that up. Reflective surfaces, uh, chrome, uh, water, uh, whether it's standing or whether it's moving water, uh, snow could cause issues, anything that's really reflective. Um, and then the, the other challenge is going to be in rain. So as the laser gets shot down and it touches a piece uh, or, or a, a raindrop, it diffracts and it basically moves that, that laser and scatters it so it doesn't return to the sensor or it returns false information back to the sensor, depending on how fast it goes. So those are some of the challenges with LIDAR, but a lot of these things can be overcome. And we're happy to talk about how to overcome some of those different things. Uh, so we'll touch briefly on what they're used for, jump into some point clouds here. So autonomous driving, a lot of cars now are using them from uh, Tesla, from uh, uh, Zooks. There, there's lots and lots of different uh, systems out there using uh, LiDAR for autonomous driving or as built or the current conditions on a building for architects. Uh, we have asset verification if you want to go and scan before a, uh, a hurricane comes through. Uh, and then pass it along to the insurance to see what was there beforehand and what's there afterwards and what's damaged. Uh, so assets, the different construction progress or digital twins were able to scan something, throw it in through a BIM program and create models very, very fast. Uh, we can also pull up different volumetric calculations of large areas. Makes it very, very simple. Now, let's go ahead and just jump into a few things before we jump into our questions. Uh, what I would like to show you is... This first one here, we're doing a uh, curb extraction test through the system. This is called uh, Leica 3DR. It's just basically pulling in the point cloud after we process the LiDAR data. So we can start doing assessments and verification on everything that we have. So I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit and you will notice there are some cars on top. Now you'll see everything is gold right now. It just makes it easier to show you over Zoom. This is colorized, but it's harder to see over Zoom uh, so that's why we've got kind of this gold color. You'll see there's some cars going up and down the street as we had scanned this information. So we can go in and clean this up. However, I want to leave it in and show you we do get those artifacts from the moving objects. Uh, we've got some heavy equipment over to the right. We've got um, basically a dirt roadway coming up. We've got a uh, an aggregate pile that we could uh, take a look and look at some volumetrics. So the whole point of this scan was actually to test out curb extraction. So we can come into the curb and let this load. We can do the uh, top curb, back of curb, and the flow line. So we can run lines throughout the system and automatically generate polylines to which we can export into a BIM environment such as uh, Civil 3D or any sort of an AutoCAD program or BricsCAD. 
um, to then have three dimensional lines to start drafting on and uh, verify that everything matches our plans. We can also overlay this on top of our plans, to make sure that everything lines up appropriately and nothing was poured incorrectly or put into one spot. Then the last data set I'll show you pretty quickly here is the mine. So I showed you the, the roulette wheel, the, um, the wheel of misfortune. This is just outside of this big giant mine pit. So this is, they were mining for manganese. Uh, they have the, the roulette wheel basically to uh, intake um, all of the, the aggregate and everything is being taken out and kind of slush it around so that they can extract the manganese out of that. So this is the actual mine um, that is just uh, about 30 or 40 feet away from uh, those pits. So this is an extremely deep mine that uh, has been here for, for many, many years. And now there is a local company who's got the contract in order to fill this in. It's gonna take a lot of aggregate to fill in uh, this area. It's also very treacherous. We can't put people down inside of the pit because as you can see, there's some uh, spill off, there's a lot of runoff that's coming down uh, where you would normally drive on top of that. There's also boats and cars that have been pushed down inside the pit uh, from uh, from some people. And so it, it's very dangerous to send someone down into the mine because you don't know what you're going to step on or or what's down there. So we're able to go through and scan it with the LiDAR system and then uh, process our volumetrics so that we can determine how much we need to basically fill this in and how we're going to do that. So with LiDAR technology, we're able to easily go into the system and figure out how much needs to go in in order to fill this in. Now you know how many trucks of, of uh, uh, dirt or aggregate that you need to bring in, how much you can break up the roulette wheels to then put it in and then uh, put dirt over the top. This gives you much more accurate calculations than you would use uh, with traditional surveys. So with that being said, um, I know it's a very, very quick rundown of what LiDAR is, kind of how it works, and some some of the different uses here for it. Um, I want to see if you guys had any additional questions. I do see there are a few questions in chat, and I'll address those in just a moment. Uh, so go ahead and ask your questions now, and um, I'll go ahead and put up my contact information. If you'd like to discuss this even more in depth, you've got a specific project in mind or uh, have some use cases or just exploring the idea of getting into LiDAR, reach out to some of our specialists here at Cooker Inc., and we'll be able to assist you in any way we can. Uh, so I, the question that I see in chat right now, uh, what is the difference between a P-series scanner and the RTC scanner? So again, the, a P-series scanner is a little more expensive. You have a lot more range. However, it takes a lot longer to go through into your scan. So in the field, you're looking at five to 10 minutes versus two to three minutes uh, for using an RTC scanner. So there's kind of a wide range of different things you can do with them. That's really one of the biggest things is it's it's a huge time saver to go with an RTC system over a, a P-series if you don't need that level of precision or distance. Uh, and then there's another question for are LiDAR drones uh, a good solution for surveyors and are they worth the expense? And I will say absolutely they are worth it for uh, many, many surveyors. So what happens is you're able to acquire data each of those points on the ground, hundreds of thousands of millions of points that are captured. Think about it, if you're a surveyor out in the field, you put your pole down, right? You've got your total station set up, you've got your GPS, one point, you go over, two points, you go over again, put your pole down, three points, versus if you fly the drone over, you've got thousands, hundreds of thousands of points within that couple of seconds that it took you to take three points. So we have more actionable data, which is why it's absolutely a, a, a great tool for surveyors. And it's absolutely worth the expense because you're going to reduce your time in the field, which means you don't have to pay your guys nearly as long to be out there and they're much more safe. So those looks at those are the two questions that I have through uh, through the Zoom chat. Uh, Douglas, do we have anything else coming over? Um, yeah, one coming in from Facebook. What is the difference in accuracy and precision of a LiDAR drone versus, say, using a LiDAR system on the ground? So what's going to happen is you always need to have control no matter how you have it set up, whether it's a static or whether it's an aerial system. So depending on the type of LiDAR it is, uh, say the DJI L1 versus the GOQ515, there's a huge, huge difference there uh, where the L1 is, is something where it's a beginning level, you can get into it. However, you're not going to have very good accuracy. When you get up to the 515 or, or even the, the 720 series, which is very, very expensive, 
um, it, you get much more precision out of it because of the type of technology. So it's a little bit of a loaded question unless you have a specific uh, uh, sensor to sensor comparison, and we can discuss those specific sensors together. Okay. So the next question up is how are data sets geo-referenced? I know you'll have fun with that one since you do a lot with it. So the data sets are geo-referenced according to, uh, well, let's first talk about the drone. So the drone itself, which is carrying, uh, say, this, this 515 payload, the, the system itself has an IMU, so it's looking at, at the vibrations as it's flying around. And then the drone also has GPS or RTK, depending on the type of drone. What it's doing is it's taking the uh, telemetry from the drone, comparing it to what's happening with the, the sensor, and now we have an exact distance from the sensor to the GPS unit or the RTK, and then an exact distance from the sensor down to the ground. So by separating the IMU or, or putting a separate IMU internally in this uh, system, we get much more precision out of that. So we're pulling all that data in either uh, GNSS uh, or with RTK, um, depends on the type of drone. Then with uh, the RTC system, what's going to happen is we're going to set out targets and we're going to mark them with, say, a, a total station and using a GPS system to then know exactly where it is on the Earth. And we're tying that target that this scanned and where the pole was to then tie it all together. So in all these different cases, you will always have to have control of some kind. Uh, no matter who tells you, you don't need as much control. That's true. But you always need some control. It's just like triangulation. Everything inside of that triangle is accurate. Anything outside of the triangle is not accurate. Not measurably accurate, I should say. I think that's one of the greatest misconceptions about LIDAR and uh, RTK or PPK workflows, period, is that uh, we hear from people, manufacturers suggest you never need control, but that's manufacturers with marketing hype as opposed to the reality of operations in the field. So one of the things that we do want to make sure that folks understand is, at least from the Kukarenkin team perspective, control is something that should always be down on the ground. Yes, some of the products that we sell, the manufacturers have marketing that says you don't need control. Um, whether you've noticed or not, generally, we try to pull those statements out of any of the marketing they provide directly to us because it simply is not factual. So it doesn't matter whether it's, it doesn't matter which brand it is. I don't need to name any of the brands, but uh, dealing with RTK, PPK, LiDAR workflows, we always need to have at least some minimal level of control. Well, that brings us to the end of our, our time here. We actually have gone about three minutes over. Uh, if you have questions, you you certainly can email them to us here at Kukarenkin. You saw Brady's information and uh, you've got in your chat box there phone numbers and contact for all of our, our various stores across the Western United States, as well as an opportunity to pick up one of our, our uh, 2023 calendars, which are super popular in the survey and construction world because of their size and you can write dates, et cetera, on them. Uh, I want to uh, thank Brady for taking the time to put together this lunch and learn it was a really quick turnaround when we learned that we had to cancel the uh, the map tech or rather reschedule the map tech program you will receive an email for the the map tech uh, product uh, uh, lunch and learn as soon as we have that rescheduled we hope to have that happening sooner than later needless to say we're grateful that you are willing to spend some of your very valuable time with us on wednesday afternoons so uh, until next time We'll see you next Wednesday, same time, uh, at Kukarenkin uh, Lunch and Learns every Wednesday at noon. Check our event bright, bright page for the upcoming. We've got them scheduled all the way out till August now. So be sure to sign up early and get your seats. And we will see you next Wednesday. Until then, be safe.